Hey there, and welcome to Ode to a Mockingbird, a sleep podcast where you'll hear cherished classics served up with laid-back southern charm. I'm your host, Jake Phillips, and I'm looking forward to spending the next few minutes together. Now sit back and relax. Hey, welcome back to Ode to a Mockingbird. I'm Jake. On this episode, we're going to read Robert Frost. He's one of the greatest American poets of the 20th century. The Road Not Taken Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. stopping by woods on a snowy evening. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep. But I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. Fire and ice. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. Mending wall. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it, and spills the upper boulders in the sun, and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made repair where they have left not one stone on a stone but they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. 
The gaps, I mean. No one has seen them made or heard them made, but at spring mending time we find them here. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go, to each the boulders that have fallen to each. And some are loaves, and some so nearly balls we have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, one on a side. It comes to a little more. There where it is, we do not need the wall. He is all pine, and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. I could say elves to him, but it's not exa but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand like an old stone savage armed. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only, in the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying, and he likes having thought of it so well, he says again, good fences make good neighbors. Nothing gold can stay. Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold, her early leaf's a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief, so dawn goes down today. Nothing gold can stay. After apple picking, my long two-pointed ladders sticking through a tree toward heaven still, and there's a barrel that I didn't fill beside it, and there may be two or three apples I didn't pick upon some bough, but I'm done with apple picking now. Essence of winter sleep is on the night, the scent of apples. I am drowsing off. I cannot rub the strangeness from my sight I got from looking through a pane of glass I skimmed this morning from the drinking trough and held against the world of hoary grass. It melted, and I let it fall and break. But I was well upon my way to sleep before it fell, and I could tell what form my dreaming was about to take. Magnified apples appear and disappear, stem end and blossom end, and every fleck of russet showing clear. My instep arch not only keeps the ache, it keeps the pressure of a ladder round. I feel the ladder sway as the boughs bend, and I keep hearing from the cellar bin the rumbling sound of load on load of apples coming in. For I have had too much of apple picking. I am overtired of the great harvest I myself desired. There were ten thousand thousand fruit to touch, Cherish in hand, lift down, and not let fall. For all that struck the earth, no matter if not bruised or spiked with stubble, went surely to the cider apple heap as of no worth. One can see what will trouble this sleep of mine, whatever sleep it is. Were he not gone, the woodchuck could say whether it's like his long sleep as I describe its coming in, 
or just some human sleep. At Woodward's Gardens, a boy, presuming on his intellect, once showed two little monkeys in a cage a burning glass they could not understand and never could be made to understand. Words are no good. To say it was a lens for gathering solar rays would not have helped. But let him show them how the weapon worked. He made the sun a pinpoint on the nose of first one, then the other, till it brought a look of puzzled dimness in their eyes that blinking could not seem to blink away. Christmas trees. The city had withdrawn into itself and left at last the country to the country when between worlds of snow not to come to lie and worlds of foliage not yet laid, there drove a stranger to our yard who looked the city, yet did in country fashion, in that there he sat and waited till he drew us out a buttoning coats to ask him who he was. He proved to be the city come again to look for something it had left behind and could not do without and keep its Christmas. He asked if I would sell my Christmas trees, my woods, the young fir balsams like a place where houses all are churches and have spires. I hadn't thought of them as Christmas trees. I doubt if I was tempted for a moment to sell them off their feet to go in cars and leave the slope behind the house all bare. And the sun shines now no warmer than the moon. I'd hate to have them know it if I was. Yet more I'd hate to hold my trees except as others hold theirs or refuse for them beyond the time of profitable growth. The trial by market everything must come to. I dallied so much with the thought of selling. Then, whether from mistaken courtesy and fear of seeming short of speech, or whether from hope of hearing good of what was mine, I said, there aren't enough to be worthwhile. I could soon tell how many they would cut. You let me look them over. You could look, but I don't expect I'm going to let you have them. Pasture they spring in, some in clumps, too close that lop each other of boughs, but not a few, quite solitary and have equal boughs all round and round. The latter he nodded yes to, or paused to say beneath some lovelier one with a buyer's moderation. That would do. I thought so too, but wasn't there to say so. We climbed the pasture on the south, crossed over, and came down to the north. He said, A thousand. A thousand Christmas trees? At what a piece? He felt some need of softening that to me. A thousand trees would come to thirty dollars. Then I was certain I had never meant to let him have them. Never show surprise. But thirty dollars seemed so small beside the extent of pasture I should strip. Three cents, for that was all they figured out a piece. Three cents so small beside the dollar friends I should be riding to within the hour would pay in cities for good trees like those. Regular vestry trees, whole Sunday schools could, could hang enough to pick off enough. A thousand Christmas trees I didn't know I had worth three cents more to give away than sell, as may be shown by a simple calculation. Too bad I couldn't lay one in a letter. I can't help wishing I could send you one, in wishing you herewith a Merry Christmas.
birches. When I see birches bend to left and right across the lines of straighter, darker trees, I like to think some boy's been swinging them. But swinging doesn't bend them down to stay as ice storms do. Often you must have seen them loaded with ice a sunny winter morning after a rain. They click upon themselves as the breeze rises and turn many colored as the stir cracks and crazes their enamel. Soon the sun's warmth makes them shed crystal shells, shattering and avalanching on the snow crust. Such heaps of broken glass to sweep away, you'd think the inner dome of heaven had fallen. They are dragged to the withered bracken by the load, and they seem not to break, though once they are bowed so low for long, they never right themselves. You may see their trunks arching in the woods years afterwards, trailing their leaves on the ground, like girls on hands and knees that throw their hair before them over their heads to dry in the sun. But I was going to say, when Truth broke in, with all her matter of fact about the ice storm, I should prefer to have some boy bend them as he went out and in to fetch the cows. Some boy too far from town to learn baseball, whose only play was what he found himself, summer or winter, and could play alone. One by one he subdued his father's trees by riding them down over and over again until he took the stiffness out of them, and not one but hung limp, not one was left for him to conquer. He learned all there was to learn about not launching out too soon, and so not carrying the tree away clear to the ground. He always kept his poise to the top branches, climbing carefully with the same pains you use to fill a cup up to the brim and even above the brim. Then he flung outward, feet first, with a swish, kicking his way down through the air to the ground. So was I once myself, a swinger of birches. And so I dream of going back to be. It's when I'm weary of considerations, and life is too much like a pathless wood where your face burns and tickles with the cobwebs broken across it, and one eye is weeping from a twig's having lashed across it open. I'd like to get away from earth a while, and then come back to it and begin over. May no fate willingly misunderstand me and half grant what I wish and snatch me away not to return. Earth's the right place for love. I don't know where it's likely to go better. I'd like to go by climbing a birch tree and climb black branches up a snow-white trunk toward heaven till the tree could bear me no more but dipped its top and set me down again. That would be good both going and coming back. One could do worse than be a swinger of birches. Fireflies in the garden. Here come real stars to fill the upper skies, and here on earth come emulating flies, that though they never equal stars in size, and they were never really stars at heart, achieve at times a very star-like start. Only, of course, they can't sustain the part. listening to Ode to a Mockingbird, a sleep podcast. I'm your host, Jake Phillips, and it's been a real privilege to be able to spend some time with you. Please do subscribe, leave a review, and tell a friend if you're willing and able. And I look forward to meeting up with you again real soon. Until next time.